Welcome to Your Mythology Book Club. I'm Daniel, and I'm a Greek mythology enthusiast. In this series, we're covering the Iliad. This is episode 8, covering books 14 and 15. First, a recap. At the end of book 13, the Trojans were still within the Greek camp, but their attack was faltering, and Hector had listened to the advice of Polydamus to regroup. However, many of the Greeks were already wounded, including Agamemnon, Odysseus, and Diomedes. Book 14 opens with Nestor and Machaon right where we left them at the end of Book 11, inside Nestor's hut drinking wine. Remember, Machaon is the wounded Greek physician, son of the healing god Asclepios, and it was his wounding that made Achilles curious enough to send Patroclus out to investigate. The fighting is most likely quite audible from where they are. The huts are, the way I picture them, inside the outer row of ships pulled up highest on the beach, and while the Trojans hadn't yet made it past this first row of ships, the length of a single ship might be about all the distance that separates this hut they're drinking wine in from the fighting. Nestor says to Machaon, Bethink thee, noble Machaon, what had best be done. Lo, louder waxes the cry of the strong warriors by the ships. Nay, now sit where thou art, and drink the bright wine, till Hecamede of the fair tresses shall heat warm water for the bath, and wash away the clotted blood. But I will speedily go forth and come to a place of outlook. So, while Machaon continues resting here from his wounds, Nestor puts on his armor, picks up a bronze spear, and goes outside to see how things are going for the Greeks. And Nestor quickly sees that things are not going well for the Greeks. Trojans are in the camp, fighting is all around, and the wall has been torn down. He stands for a moment, deciding what to do. Should he join the fight, or should he go and find Agamemnon and talk strategy with him? He decides he's more useful, at his age, as a counselor than as a warrior, and Nestor goes to find Agamemnon. Nestor finds Agamemnon, and Odysseus and Diomedes as well, all wounded, dragged up and deposited on the shore where the beach meets the plain, as far from the fighting as they could be placed. It's a sad sight. There are three of the most powerful of the Greek fighters, laid up like this. As a geography side note, there's a reference in the text here at line 35 to the camp being enclosed by two headlands. This is relevant if you're envisioning the Greek camp as being along a beach rather than the more novel spit of land camp configuration as we discussed in the previous episode. A footnote in Green's translation indicates the thought that the two headlands are Sigeon and Rhotium. Rhodium is a site directly north of Troy and is traditionally the site of Telamonian Ias's tomb. But as Rhodium is across the former bay, I don't think it's a possible endpoint of the Greek camp. And even if you're envisioning the geography then as it is now without a bay, it would mean that the Greek camp was bisected by the mouth of the Scamander River. And there's no mention of the river within the camp to support this. So I think we can throw Rhotium right out as being one of the headlands marking an endpoint of the beach camp. A more likely pair of headlands, if you're looking to firm up a beach camp vision in your mind, would be Cape Sigion in the north, which is the point where the land turns east, and south of that point, the headland called Sivri Tepi today, just south of the modern town of Yenikoi. This is the place traditionally associated with the tomb of Achilles. Anyway, upon seeing Nestor, Agamemnon calls out to him, O Nestor, son of Neleus, great glory of the Achaeans, wherefore dost thou come hither and hast deserted the war, the bane of men? Lo, I fear the accomplishment of the word that dread Hector spake and the threat wherewith he threatened us, speaking in the assembly of the Trojans, namely, that never would he return to Ilios from the ships, till he had burned the ships with fire and slain the men. Even so he spake, and lo, now all these things are being fulfilled. Alas, surely even the other well-grieved Achaeans store wrath against me in their hearts, like Achilles, and have no desire to fight by the rearmost ships." Agamemnon is giving us some particularly insecure Agamemnon talk, even for Agamemnon, not only saying he fears that Hector will defeat them, but that the Greeks aren't fighting as hard as they can because they have a grudge against him. Nope, buddy, although they'd be justified in holding a grudge against you, they don't. They should all hold a grudge against you because how you treated Achilles has directly resulted in this massive setback for the Greeks and in so, so many deaths. But only Achilles has a grudge against you. 
Bad move, Agamemnon, pissing off the guy who is not only your best warrior, but whose divine mother was owed a favor by Zeus. You really blew it, Agamemnon. Nestor, wisely, doesn't respond directly to Agamemnon's self-pity and paranoia, instead talking more about the situation in general and pointing Agamemnon towards a solution by saying, Verily, these things are now at hand, and being accomplished, nor otherwise could Zeus himself contrive them, he that thundereth on high. For lo, the wall is overthrown, wherein we trusted that it should be an unbroken bulwark of the ships and of our own bodies. And these men by the swift ships have endless battle without sparing, and no more couldst thou tell, howsoever closely thou might spy, from what side the Achaeans are driven in rout, so confusedly are they slain, and the cry of battle goeth up to heaven. But let us take counsel, how these things may best be done, if wit may do aught. But into the war I counsel not that we should go down, for in no wise may a wounded man do battle. Nestor is saying that things are really bad now. With the wall down, the Greeks are getting chased around within the camp so that you can't even really tell which way they're running. It's just all chaos in the camp. He says we need to find a solution, but you three joining the battle isn't the right solution. You're all too wounded. Despite Nestor's gentle redirecting, Agamemnon is in full despair mode now, saying, Nestor, for that they are warring by the rearmost ships, and the well-builded wall hath availed not, nor the trench, whereat the Ancaeans endured so much labor, hoping in their hearts that it should be the unbroken bulwark of the ships, and of their own bodies. Such it seemeth must be the will of Zeus supreme, that the Achaeans should perish here, nameless, far from Argos. For I knew it when he was forward to aid the Danaeans, and now I know that he is giving to the Trojans glory like that of the blessed gods, and hath bound our hands and our strength." But come, as I declare, let us all obey. Let us drag down the ships that are drawn up in the first line near to the sea and speed them all forth to the salt sea divine and moor them far out with stones till the divine night comes. If even at night the Trojans will refrain from war and then might we drag down all the ships for there is no shame in fleeing from ruin. Yea, even in the night, better doth he fare who flees from trouble than he that is overtaken. Agamemnon says he can see that Zeus is supporting the Trojans now, and so it's hopeless. He wants them to pull the ships into the water and escape. That's it. Let's just give up. His plan is that they should pull the ships into the water now, anchor them offshore. Then tonight, if the Trojans rest for the night, the Greeks can wade out and board the ships for home. Remember early on in the Iliad, when Agamemnon used the threat of abandoning the war as a trick? to see who is loyal to the cause? Now it's Agamemnon who's being disloyal. He's being caught in his own trap now, and it's Odysseus who will prove more loyal than the high king. Because Odysseus is overhearing this talk and is immediately angered, replying to Agamemnon, Atreus' son, what word hath passed the door of thy lips? Man of mischief, sure thou shouldst lead some other inglorious army, not be king among us, to whom Zeus hath given it, from youth even unto age, to wind the skein of grievous wars, till every man of us perish. Art thou indeed so eager to leave the wide-wayed city of the Trojans, the city for which we endure with sorrow so many evils? Be silent, lest some other of the Achaeans hear this word, that no man should so much as suffer to pass through his mouth, None that understandeth in his heart how to speak fit counsel. None that is a sceptred king and hath hosts obeying him so many as the Argives over whom thou reignst. And now I wholly scorn thy thoughts, such a word as thou hath uttered. Thou that in the midst of war and battle doth bid us draw down the well-timbered ships to the sea, that even more than ever the Trojans may possess their desire, albeit they win the mastery even now, and sheer destruction fall upon us. For the Achaeans will not make good the war when the ships are drawn down to the salt sea, but will look round about to flee and withdraw from battle. There will thy counsel work a mischief, O marshal of the host." 
Odysseus wonders how Agamemnon could say such things and is really calling him out here. Agamemnon, you who are a king and leader of men, we've all been tasked by Zeus as warriors to fight to the last man for our whole lives. That's the duty we're called to. And after all we've endured so much in order to capture Troy, for you to want to just sail on home like none of this mattered. Keep quiet in case some of the men hear this kind of talk, because it could be the death of us all if they panic and abandon the fight. Besides, once the ships are in the water, the men will definitely all stop fighting, and that will spell the end for us. There won't be any waiting till night to escape. We'll all just be done for immediately. Agamemnon is now suitably chastised and wishes aloud someone could give him better advice than he can come up with by himself. Odysseus, right sharply hast thou touched my heart with thy stern reproof. Nay, I do not bid the sons of the Achaeans to drag against their will the well-timbered ships to the salt sea. Now perchance there may be one who will utter a wiser counsel than this of mine, a young man or an old. Welcome would it be to me. Diomedes now interjects with a response that's very characteristic of Diomedes, proper heroic talk. The man is near. Not long shall we seek him, if ye be willing to be persuaded of me, and each of you be not resentful at all, because in years I am the youngest among you. Nay, but I too boast me to come from a lineage by a noble sire, Tydeus, whom in Thebes the piled-up earth doth cover. For Portheus had three well-born children, and they dwelt in Pluron, and steep Caledon, even Agrios and Melos, and the third was Enos, the knight, the father of my father, and in valor he excelled the others. And there he abode, but my father dwelt at Argos, whither he had wandered, for so Zeus and the other gods willed that it should be. And he wedded one of the daughters of Adrastos, and dwelt in a house full of livelihood, and had wheat-bearing fields enough, and many orchards of trees apart, and many sheep were his, and in skill with the spear he excelled all the Achaeans. These things ye must have heard, if I speak sooth. Therefore ye could not say that I am weak and a coward by lineage, and so dishonor my spoken counsel, that I may well speak. Let us go down to the battle, wounded as we are, since we needs must. And then might we hold ourselves aloof from the battle, beyond the range of darts, lest any take wound upon wound. But the others we will spur on, even them that aforetime gave place to their passion, and stand apart, and fight not. So Diomedes is apologizing for his youth compared to their experience, but he also says he's from a good family, implying this gives him some grounds to rejoin the fight. Although they are all too wounded to fight, their presence in the battle as leaders and encouragers of the fighters is valuable. So let's get up and do what we can. And they all agree with him, and they all get up to go back to the fighting. Now, as they're walking back to the site of the battle, limping with their pain and wounds, an old man that they don't know appears and walks alongside them. This old man takes Agamemnon's hand and says to him, Atreides, now methinks the ruinous heart of Achilles rejoices in his breast as he beholds the slaughter and flight of the Achaeans, since he hath no wisdom, not a grain. Nay, even so may he perish likewise, and God mar him. But with thee... The blessed gods are not utterly wroth, nay, even yet, methinks, the leaders and rulers of the Trojans will cover the wine plain with dust, and thyself shalt see them fleeing to the city from the ships and the huts. So this old man is saying Achilles must really be happy now to see the Greeks in such dire straits. He's such a heartless guy. But with you, Agamemnon, and these other leaders of the Greeks, the gods have no particular anger, and maybe yet some god will come to your aid. Then this anonymous old man does something really unexpected. The text reads, So spake he, and shouted mightily, and he sped over the plain, and loud as 9,000 men, or 10,000 cry in battle, when they join the strife of war, so mightily was the cry that the strong shaker of the earth sent forth from his breast, and great strength he put into the heart of each of the Achaeans to strive and war unceasingly. After walking alongside them in the form of an old man, this mysterious figure suddenly charges forward toward the fighting at incredible speed and shouts aloud as loudly as 10,000 men. This was, of course, 
no old man. It was the god Poseidon, and his shout re-energizes the Greeks. Now, from the top of Mount Olympus, Hera sees Poseidon doing this and recognizes what he's doing. And she decides to act now, now that she has a divine ally to help save the Greeks. Hera feels hatred towards Zeus in her heart. Hatred that he's allowing the Greeks to be destroyed. And she has a plan. It's a very sneaky plan to disable Zeus and allow Poseidon to aid the Greeks more openly. Hera is sure her plan will work because she knows her hated husband so well and knows his weakness. So she takes out her secret key and unlocks the mechanical door of the secret chamber her son Hephaestus had made for her. He is so good with complex, wondrous inventions. Zeus doesn't know about the secret chamber. Inside, Hera bathes herself and applies divine ambrosial perfumes and puts on the beautiful robe Athene had made for her and earrings with triple mulberry clusters and a belt with many tassels and a veil and gleaming sandals. But all this isn't enough. She's not going for enough. She's going for overboard. She wants to overwhelm Zeus with the desire to distract him from noticing Poseidon helping the Greeks. So, once she emerges from her chamber, Hera calls out to Aphrodite to ask for a favor. Now, Hera can't confide in Aphrodite and just come out and say why she needs what she needs, because Aphrodite sides with the Trojans. Not only is Aphrodite's son Aeneas one of the Trojan leaders, but in that beauty contest between the three goddesses which ignited the war, Aphrodite was judged by Paris to be the most beautiful, and for this, he was awarded Helen. But he also earned the enmity of Hera and Athene, those are the other two contestants in the contest, and gained Aphrodite as a firm Trojan ally. So Hera has to tell Aphrodite a little white lie. Hera says, Give me now love and desire, wherewith thou doth overcome all the immortals and mortal men. For I am going to visit the limits of the bountiful earth, and Oceanos, father of the gods, and mother Tethys, who reared me well and nourished me in their halls, having taken me from Rhea, when far-seeing Zeus in prison Kronos beneath the earth and the unvintage sea. Them am I going to visit, and their endless strife will I loose. For already this long time they hold apart from each other, apart from love and the marriage bed, since wrath had settled in their hearts. If with words I might persuade their hearts and bring them back to love and the marriage bed, ever should I be called dear to them and worshipful. So Hera is asking Aphrodite to borrow her divine power of love and desire. But not for herself, because its use would be too obvious. Aphrodite would suspect what Hera is up to. So Hera explained that she's going to visit the gods Ocean and Tethys, who cared for her when she was little. And these two have been fighting, and their marriage is on the rocks. If I could just borrow your power of love and desire, Aphrodite, I could help these two out. I could get them back together. And, of course, Aphrodite falls for it and hands over her power. Just like that. Hera's got what she wanted. Not just enough power to overcome Zeus with desire and distract him completely from the war, but way overboard, more than enough power to thoroughly distract Zeus with desire for her. Aphrodite's item that she's given Hera, her source of love and desire, hasn't been described very thoroughly. And depending on your translation, might be called variously a girdle or a belt or some other item. It's embroidered, that's for certain. Quite possibly what the author meant was the strophic, which is basically a strip of cloth tied in the back and used as a bra in ancient times. Whatever it actually is, Hera has it now. And with Aphrodite's power of love and desire in hand, you should have a pretty clear idea by now of what Hera plans. And you'd be right. But if you think that this is 
all that she's bringing to Zeus, you'd be wrong. Because Hera has got even more in mind. And to that end, next, she leaves Olympus, which can be imagined variously as both an other, otherworldly, heavenly location, or as the top of the physical Mount Olympus, which is a real mountain in northeast mainland Greece. From Olympus, she flies in a really roundabout way to the island of Lemnos, which is in the North Aegean Sea. Like Poseidon's route recently, it's a little mysterious why she goes such an indirect way, but in this case, Green's translation has a footnote which indicates her route was probably reflective of the way people sailed in ancient times, which was to hug coastlines and avoid open water. So now at Lemnos, uh, which is an island associated strongly with uh, Hera's son Hephaestus, Hera finds the god of sleep, who is usually just called sleep in the translations. If you want a more mythological sounding name for him, you can call him Hypnos. That's what I'm going to do. I like a little bombast and a little more meaty sounding name. Hera asks Hypnos to put Zeus to sleep and promises that if he helps her, she'll have Hephaestus make for him a golden throne and a golden footstool. Hypnos, however, isn't too keen on going against Zeus and shares the story of the last time Hera came to him with just such a request. Hera, goddess and queen, daughter of mighty Kronos, another of the eternal gods, might I lightly lull to slumber, yea, were it the streams of Okeanos himself that is the father of them all. But to Zeus, the son of Kronos, might I not draw near, nor lull him to slumber, unless himself commanded it. For ere now did a behest of thine teach me a lesson, on the day when that famed high-hearted son of Zeus sailed from Ilios when he had sacked the city of the Trojans. Then verily I lulled the soul of Aegis-bearing Zeus with my sweet influence poured about him, and thou didst contrive evil against him in thy heart, and didst rouse over the sea the blasts of violent winds, and Heracles thou then didst bear to well-peopled costs far from all his friends. But Zeus, when he awakened, was wrathful, and dashed the gods about his mansion, and me above all he sought, and he would have cast me from the upper air to perish in the deep, if night had not saved me, night that subdues both gods and men. To her I came as a suppliant in my flight, and he ceased from pursuing, wrathful as he was, for he was in awe of doing aught displeasing to swift night. And now again, thou bids me to accomplish this other task that may not be accomplished. Hypnos' story references a time when Heracles had just sacked the city of Troy. This was years ago. And on his way home, Hera wanted to cause trouble for Heracles. And she was always doing that. So she got Hypnos to do just what she wants him to do now. Distract Zeus by putting him to sleep. But when Zeus eventually did awaken, he was enraged against Hypnos and would have destroyed him if Hypnos hadn't gone to night. The goddess who sounds way cooler when you call her Nyx, spelled N-Y-X, who was, according to Orphic tradition, among the most sacred, ancient, and revered of the gods, far older than the generation of the Olympians like Zeus and Hera, and older even than the Titans who were their parents' generation. So Hypnos is trying politely to say no to Hera without her getting mad at him. Hera now ups the ante and offers to marry Hypnos to Pasiphae, one of the goddesses known as the Graces, a group of goddesses devoted to beauty, charm, creativity, and fertility. Hypnos likes the offer, but wants to know that Hera will keep her promise, so he makes Hera swear. Hera places one hand on the earth and the other in the sea so that both realms can bear witness to the promise, and then she swears by the water of the river Styx, which is the inviolable oath of the gods. Convinced now by her oath that Hera really will give him Pasiphae in marriage, Hypnos now goes with Hera to Mount Ida, the mountain looming over Troy, upon which Zeus has been perched watching the war, at least when he's not randomly watching something else going on on Earth. Hypnos climbs up a fir tree on the mountainside and takes the form of an owl. The text here gives two names for this kind of owl, one by which it's known among humans, and the other which is its name among the gods. 
And this is one of just a handful of instances in the Iliad where we're given separate human and divine names for things. The most notable being the river, which humans call the Scamander or Scamandros, but the gods call the Xanthos. I did a little digging here because I felt that there was the tantalizing prospect of a whole divine language here. But that doesn't seem to be the case. I have posted a couple of links on the subject in the show notes. And although it's really paltry how little information there is out there on this topic, long story short, it seems that these few instances where there's a divine and a mortal name for things are just these handful of cases and likely are simply reflections of the names of things from a previous non-Greek-speaking inhabitants of the area. There's one dissertation I found which suggests that the name Xanthos, and this is a recurrent name in the Iliad, which shows up as the name of a river and a horse owned by Achilles, and there's actually a man uh, named Xanthos, that the name Xanthos, uh, whose plain meaning is yellow or blonde, is associated with immortality. And that's really all I could find on the matter. So I don't think we're going to uncover a hidden language of the Olympian gods, unfortunately, outside of these handful of words. Sorry, I tried. So with Hypnos now hiding as an owl in a fir tree, waiting for his time to hit Zeus with the power of sleep, Hera continues on up to the peak of Ida to the crag known as Gargaros, where she finds Zeus. Zeus is immediately smitten with lust for her, just as she'd planned, as strongly as when they'd first been together. But he's maybe also a little suspicious, because he asks her why she's here, and why she came without her divine chariot. That seems a little fishy. Hera wants to keep her story straight, so she uses the same lie on Zeus that she told Aphrodite, that she's on her way to the ends of the earth to visit Ocean and Tethys, and she wanted to stop by and tell Zeus she's going, so he won't miss her later and be mad because she didn't say where she was going. Now, I'll just explain a little bit here. The gods that she's going to see, Ocean and Tethys, Ocean being the god of the ocean. The ancients conceived of the ocean, the real ocean, not the enclosed seas of the Mediterranean, the Black and Red Seas. The ocean, uh, they've envisioned as encircling the lands of the earth. So land in the middle, ocean around. And if you put yourself in their shoes with the limited knowledge of geography that they had, it kind of makes sense. They knew that there was a seemingly boundless ocean beyond these three inland seas. They knew there was an ocean in the far west beyond what we call the Straits of Gibraltar, where Spain and Morocco almost meet, and that this endless ocean is also encountered in the south beyond the opening of the Red Sea, and even in the far north in what we call the Baltic Sea, although this was a particularly mysterious, mythical, and, and barely known place to them. So I'm really going so far away, Zeus, Hera says, and I'm just stopping by to tell you that I'm going. Don't be mad at me. Oh, and my chariot. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My chariot. I parked that. It's, it's down at the foot of the mountain, right, right down there. But Zeus is not thinking about being mad at her or really getting all that suspicious. He wants to have sex with her. And he says he wants her so bad, he wants her as bad as when, and then he rattles off a long list of other women and goddesses he's slept with before. You've got to hear this. It's got to be among the worst pickup attempts in history. Hera, thither mayest thou go on a later day. But come, let us twain take pleasure in the bed of love. For never once as thus did the love of goddess or woman so mightily overflow and conquer the heart within my breast. Not when I loved the wife of Ixion, who bore Parathus, the peer of gods in council, nor when I loved Danae of the fair ankles, daughter of Acrisios, who bore Perseus, most renowned of all men, nor when I loved the famed daughter of Phoenix, who bore me Minos, and godlike Radamanthus, nay, nor even when I loved Semele, nor Alcmene in Thebes, and she bore Heracles, a hardy child of heart. But Semele bore Dionysus, a delight to mortals. Nay, nor when I loved the fair-tressed queen, Demeter, nor renowned Leto, nay, nor thy very self, he remembers to mention her, thy very self, as I now love thee, and sweet desire possesses me. 
This is not a great way to get someone to want to be with you, especially your own wife. He's particularly not self-aware, isn't he? And certainly doesn't care what Hera thinks or feels. But, fortunately for Zeus, Hera's on a mission, so she lets slide what might normally have been the spark of a fight between them. Hera says what? You want little old me? Well, we can't do anything here. It's too public. Let's go somewhere private. Now, she's likely wanting to get him back to Olympos, into that secret locked room that only she has a key to that we heard about before, where she wants to knock him out with the love powers and the sleeping powers and lock him in. She even mentions the chamber to him. Most dread son of Kronos, what a word thou hast spoken. If now thou dost long to be couched in love on the crests of Ida, and all stands plain to view... How would it be if someone of the eternal gods should see us slumbering and go and tell it to all the gods? It is not that I could arise from the couch and go again to thy house. Nay, it would be a thing for righteous anger. But if thou wilt, and it is dear to thy heart, thou hast a chamber that thine own son Hephaestus builded, and fasten strong doors to the pillar. Thither let us go and lie down, if the couch be thy desire. But Zeus whether he's suspicious or just wants to get it on quickly, isn't going to bother going back to Olympus right now. The time for loving is now. Zeus casts the divine obscuring mist about them, and he causes the ground to spring forth soft grass and flowers to be a bed for them. And there's a modest skipping over, next, of what must have happened, just a line about how the king of gods was overcome by love and sleep. Now, after knocking Zeus out, Hypnos rushes down to the Greek camp where Poseidon is still helping, but in a limited way, remember, covertly in the form of a man to let Poseidon know that he can aid the Greeks openly now. And learning that he can work openly now, Poseidon wastes no time. Or does he? He announces to the Greeks, Argives, are we again to yield the victory to Hector, son of Priam? that he may take our ships and win renown? Nay, even so he saith and declareth that he will do, for that Achilles by the hollow ships abides angered at heart. But for him there will be no such extreme regret if we spur us on to aid each the other. Nay, come as I command, let us all obey. Let us harness us in the best shields that are in the host, and the greatest, and cover our heads with shining helms, and take the longest spears in our hands, and so go forth. Yea, and I will lead the way, and methinks that Hector, son of Priam, will not long await us for all his eagerness. And whatsoever man is steadfast in battle, and hath a small buckler on his shoulder, let him give it to a worse man, and harness him in a larger shield. So spake he, and they heard him eagerly and obeyed him. And them the kings themselves arrayed, wounded as they were, Tydeus' son and Odysseus and Agamemnon, son of Atreus. They went through all the host and made exchange of weapons of war. The good arms did the good warriors harness in, and worse he gave to the worse. Now, it's been noted as problematic that Poseidon wants them all in the midst of battle, remember, look, the battle's still going on, the Trojans are right there, to go back to their huts for better equipment and swap equipment around and everyone's supposed to, like, have, you know, the better warriors be in the better equipment. Poseidon's a god. Can't he just magic up some better equipment for them or teleport the Trojans to the bottom of the sea? But they do all this ridiculous swapping. They all trade weapons and armor around so that they've maximized the best equipment for the best fighters. This is usually an automated feature in RPGs. You just click optimize or whatever, and it goes through your inventory and equips your characters with the best stuff for each of them. And now Poseidon drops his old man disguise and leads the Greeks himself with a sword that's long and sharp like lightning. This is pretty cool. Listen to this. Poseidon led them, the shaker of the earth, with a dread sword of fine edge in his strong hand, like unto lightning, wherewith it is not permitted that any should mingle in woeful war, but fear holds men afar therefrom. But the Trojans on the other side was renowned Hector arraying. Then did they now strain the fiercest strife of war, even dark-haired Poseidon and glorious Hector, one succoring the Trojans, the other the Argives. And the sea washed up to the huts and ships of the Argives, and they gathered together with a mighty cry, 
Not so loudly bellows the wave of the sea against the land, stirred up from the deep by the harsh breath of the north wind. Nor so loud is the roar of burning fire in the glades of a mountain when it springs to burn up the forest. Nor calls the wind so loudly in the high leafy tresses of the trees when it rages and roars its loudest, as then was the cry of the Trojans and the Achaeans shouting dreadfully as they rushed upon each other. Now, both sides are facing each other with a tremendously loud roar, and the sea is swelling up and crashing, and the two sides renew their attack upon one another. Hector throws his spear at Telamone and Aias, but it strikes where Aias's two belts or baldricks meet, and the attack is ineffective. Hector is enraged at having missed, but draws back into the body of the Trojans for safety. However, Aias is not done with Hector. He lifts up a giant rock and flings it at Hector, and it hits and spins Hector round like a top. Hector is dropped to the ground, and his other spear falls from his hand. Now the Greeks let fly a volley of spears at the Trojans to keep them at bay, while another mass of Greeks rush forward, hoping to grab Hector, whether he's alive or dead right now, and drag him back to their side where they can finish him off and ideally loot his corpse. Step one, kill a guy. Step two, loot his corpse. That is Bronze Age Heroic Warring 101. But the Trojans mount a valiant defense of the unconscious Hector. Aeneas, Polydamus, Agenor, Sarpedon, and Glaucos all surround Hector with their shields, while Hector's chariot is brought up, and they lift him onto it and hurry him away from the fighting. These named fighters remain in the fight, while various unnamed Trojans accompany unconscious Hector on the trip back to Troy. We follow Hector now, and the unnamed Trojans out of the battle. As they're crossing the ford of the river Scamandros, they stop the chariot and splash water on still unconscious Hector. The water revives him briefly, long enough for him to vomit blood into the river and then pass out again. The chariot continues on toward Troy. Back at the battle, Oilian Aias now stabs a Trojan named Satnios in the side and he falls to the ground. Polydamus steps forward to defend Satnios and spears a Greek named Protheonor clean through his shoulder and exclaims, Verily, methinks that again, from the strong hand of the high-hearted son of Panthos, the spear hath not leaped in vain. Nay, one of the Argives hath caught it in his flesh, and leaning thereon for a staff, methinks that he will go down within the halls of Hades." This boasting enrages Aias, who throws his spear at Polydamus. Polydamus jumps aside, and the spear hits Archilochos, Antenor's son, slicing clean through his neck so that his head thumps on the ground before his knees even buckle. Aias now boasts, Consider Polydamus, and tell me truly, whether thou sayest not that this man is worth slaying in place of Protheonor. He seems to me no coward, nor born of cowards, but a brother of horse-taming Antenor, or a child, for he most closely favoreth his house. Achamas, Archilochus's brother, stands over the dead and strikes out and kills a Greek Boeotian named Promachos, who is trying to drag his dead brother away, and says, Ye Argive bowmen, insatiate of threats, Verily not for us alone shall there be struggle and toil, nay, but even as we shall likewise perish. Consider how your promaco sleepeth, vanquished by my spear, that my brother's blood price may not be long unpaid. Even for this it is that a man may well pray to leave some kinsman in his halls that will avenge his fall. Now this bragging makes the Greeks angry but especially angers one Greek named Penelos, who charges at Akamas. The text says that Akamas did not await the attack, which I think means he just stepped aside. None of this stuff we're covering right now is in the abridged versions, but it's all good, solid action fight scene stuff. It's just not super important to the story. Anyway, I enjoy it. So Penelos ends up hitting a Trojan named Ileonis instead. And what a hit it is. The spear goes down through his eye socket and severs his neck tendons. We're severing a lot of neck tendons in book 14. Ileonis is down on the ground now and most certainly dead. But Penelos 
pulls out his sword, chops Ileonis's head clean off, holds it up with the spear still protruding from the eye socket, and says, Ye Trojans, I pray you bid the dear father and mother of proud Ileonis to wail in their halls, for neither will the wife of Promachos, son of Algonor, rejoice in her dear husband's coming in that hour when we youths of the Achaeans return with our ships out of Troyland. This speech causes fear for all. The text doesn't say causes fear for the Trojans, just fear in all. And maybe it did. This was a right ghoulish thing Penelos just did. Here at the close of book 14, the narrator asks the muse to help him recall who was the first Greek to bear off loot once the battle was turned at this point by Poseidon. Tell me now, ye muses, that dwell in the mansions of Olympus, who was the first of the Achaeans to lift the bloody spoils when once the renowned shaker of the earth turned the battle? And the answer is Telamonianias, who kills a man named Hirtios. But then Antilochos kills Thacles and Mermeros. Meriones kills Hippotion and Morris. Teucros kills Prothoon and Periphetes. And Agamemnon kills Hyperenor. But no one killed as many as Oilean Ias because he was, the remember, the second fastest of the Greeks after Achilles. And the Trojans are now in full flight. The Greeks are killing Trojans as fast as they can run, with your foot speed being the only limit on your kill count. And that is how book 14 ends, with the Greeks on the upswing, chasing the Trojans right out of the camp and onto the Trojan plain. I will be back with you very soon for book 15. 